This is going to be from chapter 16 of Hammer of Thor, which is about the middle of the book. To give you the setting, it's 1943, the middle of World War II. We're in San Francisco. It's a foggy August afternoon. My hero, Francis Cater, has been trying to figure out who the bad guy is in his guild who's working with the Nazis. He found out it was a woman. <clears throat> She must have been building up the spell as I was talking. The air bolt hit Fitz in the chest and knocked him off his chair. He slammed into the wall and crumpled to the floor. From the angle of his neck, it was obvious he was dead. I scrambled for the katana talisman still on the desk, but Reynolds beat me to it, scooping it up then stumbling back on her high heels. Stabbing like a rain of exploding steel onto sheet metal, the machine gun fired and a line of red stains appeared on Reynolds' white blouse as she was knocked backward against the wall. Most people would have crumbled under the assault. She stood straighter and pointed at Harold, and he dropped the tommy gun and curled up in a ball. I'd seen that spell only once before, but I still recognized it. I didn't want to watch. Reynolds touched herself, and the stain stopped growing. Black and I attacked her simultaneously. Fire made a bright orange rainbow across the room and hit her full on the chest. It had no effect. Her protection spell was strong, helped, no doubt, by using the katana talisman. The warrior from the hall burst in at that moment and pointed his weapon at Black and me. Stop, he yelled. Shoot them, fool, Reynolds screamed. Harold squawked, a sound to shatter small trees it seemed, and came across the room, his talons cutting the carpet. He was a six-foot black bird with large eyes and obsidian talons and a yellow hooked beak. Reynolds had turned him into a rock. It would have been more merciful to kill him. Harold jumped, talons out as he sailed through the air. No! Reynolds wailed and pointed at Harold. But it was too late. Harold landed on the other warrior. Blood sprayed from the poor guy's chest and the talons cut deep. Harold's huge wings beat rapidly as he carved the warrior's flesh, filling the room with a tornado of black feathers. I stopped watching. Harold must have thought the other warrior was thre threatening his mistress. How he missed blacks in my attack, I don't know. Perhaps what le was left of his mind, a gun was more of a threat than anything else. Reynolds' plan became clear. She tore off her skirt, leaving her in girdle stockings and high heels only from the waist down. She put her hands against the outer wall and it fell away. Her blouse was darkening as her protection spell weakened. Harold dropped a string of bowels in his beak, squawked even louder, ran across the room, shredding more carpet, and jumped out the opening. Just then, Reynolds' blast caught fire, and she jumped out the gaping hole herself. A few moments later, with Reynolds straddling his back and her blast simply missing, Harold flew down the street, quickly being obscured by the fog. I said a very bad oath in the ancient language. I need a rock, I called out needlessly, and the warrior who was dead in a very large puddle of blood was the last lesser I could use. No, Black said you don't. What do you mean, I asked, looking at him. He bent down and started pulling up ripped carpet. Look in Harold's clothes, he might have a knife, Black said. Harold's suit was a pile of shredded cloth where he'd been transmortified. I dug through them and pulled out a pocket knife here. I tossed it to Black. He caught the knife, opened it, and started cutting. Get Fitz's talisman, you'll need a strong one. I saw what that samurai talisman can do. I went to Fitz's body and pulled out a pebble out of his pocket. It had scratches in it that looked as if they'd been made five minutes ago but by the spelling and grammar I could tell it had been written before or just after Atlantis sank. It was very powerful, almost a match for the katana. By then, Black had a large enough piece of carpet cut for me to sit on. He even elevated it off the floor. I jumped on it. I thought it was you, I said, sitting on the ripped and bloody floating carpet. I'm sorry. Black pointed at the hole. Get her! I flew the carpet out the hole and went in the general direction and Reynolds had gone, but I realized that was foolish. I decided I only had one hope of finding her. I went up and broke through the fog. The sky above the mist was crystal clear blue, and the fog was an intense white. The brilliance dazzled me. I surveyed the white horizon. It almost looked like a flat, snowy plain from my childhood home. North, I could see the orange tops of the towers of the Golden Gate Bridge. The Bay Bridge towers were nubbins in the distance to the east. The rust building and the Pacific Telephone Building were just poking out of the fog, the mist swirling around their tops. To the south were Mount Sutro, Mount Davidson, and the hill for Buena Vista Park. I'd expected to see Reynolds as a speck in the distance fleeing for her life, but I didn't see her at all, meaning she was still under the fog bank. I moved slowly in the last direction I'd seen her go. I could see the tops of buildings under the fog, but not the street. Off to my right, not very far away, I saw fog flowing over an obstacle. I thought it was a building just under the surface, but the object moved. I came in closer, and just as I could tell it was a rock perched on a building, I jerked the carpet away as Harold shot out of the fog. While trying to avoid the bird's talons and beak, I also managed to miss Reynolds' lightning bolt. I swung the carpet around in time to see Reynolds duck into the fog again. I chased her, diving into the cold mist. I could still see her. She looked over her shoulder and sprayed fire at me that seemed to sizzle as it cut through the fog. 
I swerved the carpet to miss it and heard small explosions behind me as the fire hit buildings. I had to decide how I was going to fight her. Reynolds was cutting around buildings, trying to lose me. I saw people on the street pointing up at us as we pat flew overhead. I decided Reynolds must be uncomfortably cold with her shoulders and arms bare and legs only protected by thin silk stockings. Reynolds ducked around the rust building. I followed, going too fast. Harold was hovering there and facing me. His talons cut painfully into my chest and knocked me off the carpet. I hung for a long, agonizing moment from those claws. Then, as my flesh ripped, I fell, watching my blood drip from the black hooks after me. I tried to work a protection spell fast before I hit what was below me. I've been told it doesn't work, but it was the only thing I had left. Something grabbed me, slowed me down, and stopped me just a few feet above the sidewalk. It was black on another piece of carpet. Got you, he said. He lured me to the ground. Lesser's watched with wide eyes as I landed on the concrete. I touched myself and healed, but my shirt was covered in blood. My carpet was fluttering to the surface. I chased it down, climbed on it, floating up to where Black was waiting. Where's Reynolds? I yelled across the gap. Don't know. I'll go above the fog, I said. You look up and down the street. What do I do if I see her? I shrugged my shoulders. Hell, I don't know. Send up a flare. I yelled and sped away above the fog. The day was still bright, and I searched for what might be Reynolds in her rock. I turned around in circles, looking in all directions. I didn't see her. About the third time around, I saw fireballs shooting up like, well, a flare. I flew toward them, dropping below the fog as I approached. Reynolds was diving down a canyon between buildings with black behind her. Reynolds shot a lightning bolt at him that missed, but it hit a building, knocking off part of the brick outer wall. The debris crashed to the ground, nearly hitting a pedestrian. The rock was getting tired, I thought, as black was gaining on her. I looked around. This was my city. I knew the shortcuts. I went right, found Market Street, raced down it, then cut left at Bush. I was right in front of her. Seeing me and panicking, Reynolds tried to go left, but a building blocked her. She smashed into the facade in a cloud of black feathers and rock shrieks. Somehow she managed to stay on the bird's back as it tumbled down the wall, then twisted itself around, spread its wings, and flew off again, although slower and, it seemed, with just a slight stiffness in its left wing. I gave chase and Black was beside me to my left. I could see Reynolds bare back had a large red scrape on the left shoulder. She didn't bother to heal it. The rock was definitely going slower. Black and I caught up, but the narrow streets meant we couldn't get besides Reynolds. Then it hit me. We were flying. I wasn't limited to two dimensions. As with the trees in the river in France, I dropped down between the buildings and under the rock, ignoring the hurricane its wings were blasting down. I pointed up and shot fire at the bird's belly. When the feathers ignited, the bird jerked spasmodically and stopped flying. It shrieked shattered glass in nearby buildings. I was nearly crushed under its fall but managed to duck out of the way. Reynolds was holding onto the bird's neck with both arms, but the beast, apparently sensing its imminent death, gained control and landed softly. It tried to rub the fire up by scraping its belly along the pavement of the street. It didn't see the trolley and neither did Reynolds who was simply holding on. The trolley hit what was left of Reynolds with a deep yet moist basso profundo sound. The bird bounced off the front of it and landed a few feet in front, with Reynolds still managing to cling to its neck. I landed and Black dropped his carpet near me. I ran to the bird looking for Reynolds. She was no longer on it. Where's Reynolds, Black said, catching up and pushing through the crowd that had gathered close but not too close. I don't know. Harold let out a rattling, squawking breath and died. Damn, where'd you go, Black said, looking around. A half-dressed woman shouldn't be too hard to find, I said. Should cost quite a ruckus. Glamour, Black said. Only we'll see her undressed. What the deuce? I looked around. She couldn't have gone far. The attack came from above and behind. Flames hit both Black and me and as Reynolds flew over us on one of our carpets. Neither of us was prepared, but Black took the brunt of it. My clothes caught fire, but I was able to extinguish the flames quickly. Black fell to the ground burning. I put out the flames with a spell that drew water out of the foggy air by cooling it. But Black was unconscious and couldn't heal himself, and of course neither could I. I yelled to the crowd, this man needs a doctor now. I heard sirens in the distance, their wails mooted by the fog it seemed. A man stepped forward, I'm a doctor, take care of him, I pleaded, placing my hand on his upper arm. Don't worry, I will, thank you. The crowd parted from me as I ran for the remaining carpet. As I approached it, it started to hover about a foot off the ground. I jumped on it, lying flat on it, and it bounced into the sky. Again, I went high over the fog, and the bright sunshine blinded me momentarily. But I saw Reynolds. This time she was fleeing, going east. I chased her. I chased her. Now it was a question of who had the most power to keep a carpet going. The problem was I needed to speed up and catch her. I didn't know why it was so, but every adept with experience of flying carpet knows if you double your speed, your energy seems to drain at least four times as fast. I suppose I could simply follow her until fatigue forced her to land, but we might be over Iowa by then, and I might tire first.
I flew faster. As I got closer, I got hit in the face with a piece of carpet. Then I noticed her rug was shredding in the wind, leaving a trail of fibers floating down. The fog was packed up against the Berkeley Hills, their green tops poking out. Wendell started going higher to pass over them. I was very close. I didn't know whether she was aware that her carpet was disintegrating. From its shape, I could tell it was the one I'd been using before. I came up behind her. She glanced over her shoulder and, seeing me, sped up. This only increased the tearing of the fabric. I decided to help it. I shot an air bolt at the carpet, not at her, but the rug she was on. She tried to duck the shot, not realizing I had aimed at the carpet and not her. She looked relieved when the attack only hit the carpet. But her relief turned to panic as the carpet tore itself in half. She held on, but it was no longer capable of supporting her. She turned over in the air and fell toward the hills in an arc. The carpet pieces dropped toward the ground like falling leaves. Rail screamed until she hit. I didn't see her hit because of the trees, but I heard it. The sound of soft flesh impacting and breaking wood was as unpleasant a sound as any I had heard that day. I won't describe what her body looked like as I searched the area for the katana talisman. It was about 20 feet east of the corpse.